Hey there you guys, it's Joe. I wanted to give you guys a quick overview on one of the more popular decks that are in the format right now, which is consisting of Opus 1 and 2, and that's Mono Lightning. And this isn't a deck that I actually play myself very often, but I think it's popular enough that I think everyone should know about it. Um, it's, you know, not my favourite deck, and it, but it has some of the strongest plays, and I wanted everyone to kind of know what they were before I kind of started going into my own deck lists again. And I also kind of wanted to turn you guys' attention to the fact that I started streaming now, and I did a deck building stream last Tuesday, and it actually went down really, really well, and I've been doing video games and a bit of drawing, a bit of card game, and a bit of everything, so do check that out, and I'll leave the link to my channel in the description box below, so if you get some time, it'd be really nice for you to join me. Now, this particular version of Mono Lightning, as I've said before, it was taken from a list from a Japanese tournament that was a bit larger scale. I think there were 84, 85 players in it, and this deck actually won that tournament. And I thought it was very different to how I would approach this deck, so I thought it was the perfect candidate to kind of, you know, show you some of the plays that this deck makes and some of the strengths of it, but also explain some of the things that I would perhaps do a bit differently. So, if you know the name of the player, because I actually don't know, the, the resource that I used didn't provide me with one, then please leave it in the comments below, because as I've said before, this deck is his and it's not mine. Now, it's important to note the core forwards that are present in most Mono Lightning decks, including this one. And those three core units tend to be Edia, the legendary unit from Opus 2, Al Cid, who is one of the rare unit or the hero units from um, Opus 2, and Amon, who is also a legendary unit from Opus 2. So it goes to show that Opus 2 actually brought a hell of a lot to this deck. Now, the reason that Al Cid is such a massive card is because he combos with a lot of cards in this deck. The primary examples of those are Onion Knight from Opus 1, um, Kane from Opus 2, and Rigdia from the FF13 starter deck. Now, the most common of these is Onion Knight. Now, when you play Al Cid and then you play an Onion Knight straight after it, using his own ability, you're burning something for 6,000 damage using Al Cid's ability, and then you're burning something for another 5,000 damage using Onion Knight's ability, totaling 11k, which is most, most of the time enough to kill most units. And you're also, because you're playing two units at the time to do that, four crystals, you're generating advantage while you're doing it. So it's actually a very, very strong play. And I actually, when I did my spoilers um, for Opus 2, when I opened my box, I got Alcid and I was like, eh, this guy's okay. And then moved on and just didn't really think about him. He's actually a really, really good card and I was completely wrong about him. Now, the other two units that go with Alcid most commonly are Kane, as I've said before. Um, Kane is used to sneak a bit of damage in because he has haste and he's like the only haste character of the null who isn't particularly good that can sneak a bit of damage in and be and be summoned off of Alcid's ability while Alcid can remove a blocker that could potentially threaten Kane at the same time so it's actually a really cheeky little play that this particular deck plays quite heavily into by playing three copies of Kane and Rigdia is kind of just a weaker version of Onion Knight but to have more than one version of it of that combo is quite nice. Um, you know, that being said, you do get the extra little dull effect um, if you do happen to kill something using Rigdia's ability rather than Al Cid's. So it's really important to kind of note the order in which you do things. Now the other two kind of big plays in Mono Lightning are a lot more simple than Al Cid is. Uh, Idia is just there, you just want to machine gun backups as quickly as you can down on the board so that you have like more versatility and more efficiency in Idia's EX burst ability and she's mostly there for that ability. She's kind of like a more consistent version of Opus 1's Kane that we had last time. Whereas Amon is there just to kind of take units out of the way and just, you know, simply remove problematic units that could get in the way of your Edia or your Alcid, things like that. Um, you know, problem cards for this deck can be like Renoa, things like that. Renoa, legendary Renoa can be a pain in the ass for most decks, but Amon can just kind of deftly move her out of the way while everyone else can just go in for the kill. Vincent is another thing that can be a problem, which is why it's another big reason to run the Alcid combos, is because that can, including using Rigdia, not just Onion Knight, can kill Vincent without actually using an ability that breaks him. Therefore, you can get around that particular play with this deck as well. Now, the other options that you have for forwards in this deck are actually pretty staggering. There's tons of different options that you have, so there's lots of wiggle room if you don't necessarily want to play it the same way that this deck is built. Um, Zalbarg in here is actually a noteworthy addition because it's a cheeky little play that comes off of um, Alcid that can be searchable through Duke Goltana due to him being a knight. So it means that Ramza, who is a blockade in this deck and is definitely a unit that I would run, is something that can be searched for as well as him. 
So you, you also have access to Lightning, which this deck has chosen not to play any copies of her, which I actually understand that. But you may want to have the bigger units, whether it be the Promo Lightning, the Legendary Lightning, you could run the Rare Lightning if you wanted to as an additional kind of more aggro-y hit. Uh, you have access to Gilgamesh. There's tons of Gilgameshes. All three of them are really, really good. This particular deck has gone for the Strongest Sword Common Gilgamesh. If it were my deck, I would probably choose to run the starter deck Divider Gilgamesh, particularly because Fasoya is present in this deck, which I'll get to in a little while. Uh, you also have uh, access to more anti-meta style plays, things like the Seifer in this deck, which is probably being used in this deck to counter things like Gold Bears or other Weenie Rush style decks. Um, you know, so it'll, you know, he's still a 7k blocker at the end of the day that can deal like um, redirected damage, which you can then, you know, use to blow up with a Black Mage from the back row. Uh, you could set up an Alcid combo. There's lots of little things that Sifa can do. Although, if it were me, I probably wouldn't play Sifa. I think that a really good card that's not very played at the moment is the 2CP Ninja from Opus 2, which has the ability of uh, two Lightning Crystals to break whatever blocks or is blocked by him, as well as himself. So it's kind of like Death Touch from Magic, but in, it doesn't, like, in this game, I think that's actually really strong because there's not a lot of things that are going to want to block you if you attack with a Ninja, so I definitely think that that's worth bearing in mind. And if you think of any other ideas that you really like to go in a Mono Lightning deck, then definitely leave them in the comments below because I'd love to see your take on it. It's not just all about kind of what we already see. I think that one of the best things about card games is kind of communicating and kind of figuring out what other people want to do that you may not have thought of. So definitely let me know if you think of anything. Now the backup lineup is slightly less malleable than the forward lineup would be in Lightning with, you know, Power Booster in Lulu is obviously kind of a staple in any monocolored deck and uh, do forgive me if I'm looking the other way, it's because I have the deck list written here so I have to kind of check it. Um, you also have access to, you want your two CP units to be as high as possible, particularly in a deck that needs to machine gun them down for Edia's sake as much as possible. Red Mage is kind of a shoe in because giving your guys haste is really strong. Black Mage. I'm less keen on Opus 1 Black Mage than Opus 2 Black Mage, but I still would play Opus 1 Black Mage because I think it's really important to have things like um, being able to hit it with all sorts of different things, like your Seifers, uh, like your Alcid, you could re you could kill one unit and damage another, therefore setting yourself up to blow it up with a, with a Black Mage. Uh, you have access to, I mean, this deck runs three copies of Evoker. I usually only run two copies of Evoker in a monocolor deck because while I think it's important to have access to it in this kind of thing, because it's much more important than it is in a multicolored deck, I still don't want to see it in my opening hand generally. So I think two is the right number, not three. But, you know, everyone plays in different ways. And then uh, Duke Coltana, I mean, there's a searcher is actually very important in every deck I've discovered and it has nothing to do with the consistency of the deck. I mean, obviously that's nice, but let's think about a particular situation. If you open a hand that's terrible, um, say, I mean, I'm obviously very fond of earth and water. Let's say I open uh, two Cloud of Darkness or three um, snow in, not snow, um, but yeah, no, right, we're playing ice. Let's say I open three snow in my opening hand. You're gonna wanna mulligan that. So you're gonna put that on the bottom of your deck. You're not gonna see a single copy of Snow now for the rest of the game. So if you if you include a searcher in your deck for anything, it allows you to shuffle your deck, meaning that you can randomize your deck again so that you may see the cards that you thought you might not earlier than it would have been like never happening. Because if you're gonna see those cards at the bottom of your deck, chances are you're gonna deck out before you get to do anything with them. So having a searcher in your deck with this deck, it's either Duke Altana, which will search up either Ramza, uh, Primo Lightning, who is also a knight, or Zalbarg, or you could use Gramis uh, to search up uh, Al Cid. Both are perfectly viable options. You could run one of each if you wanted to. Um, Lulu is obviously a given, as I've said. Magus is a card I would not run. Now, I, I don't particularly like Magus. I think that three drop, three cost to kind of just burn a little bit isn't enough for me. But I, you know, that's something that I would probably drop out for. Um, either the Opus 2 Black Mage, who I actually think is very, very strong, especially in this particular deck. Um, and then you have uh, Ninja, who's another 2 CP unit, so again, you want to keep those high. I would probably, if I was going to include the Black Mage from Opus 2, I'd probably drop at least one of these and the Magus to have them, because A, a increases my 2 CP count, allowing me for more consistent turn 1 plays, and B, I think that the combo pieces work more favourably um, with Opus 2 Black Mage than it does with Ninja. For example, Vincent is a problem, you could play a um, Opus 2 Black Mage to drop his power by 4k and then finish him off with an Onion Knight and kill him. There's loads of 
enablers that that card allows you to have. And then last, uh, so, uh, well, it's not lastly quite, because Seymour is kind of a given in most um, Lightning decks, even if they're duo-coloured or even multi-coloured, multi just because just having the ability to kill something and get it out of the way while still building up your back row is really, really nice, but it's kind of a given, so we kind of gloss over that. But the Fasoya in this deck is very interesting. Now, you guys all know that I'm very fond of Fasoya, and I've liked him for a very long time, but in this deck I'm actually very fond of him because he combos very well with pretty much everything in this deck. You know, you don't have the strongest power behind your forwards as a lot of decks do, which is something that if you're playing against this deck is worth noting. But at the same time, it's something that you can stop your opponent from hitting you. It's a defensive play, and it also combos well with, again, Black Mage, Cyclops, um, the damage dealing forwards like Onion Knight, Rigdia. There's so many things that make for Soya worth playing that I definitely would run a copy of it in here. Now, the, the summons are kind of a lot less interesting because, unfortunately, there aren't very many good ones. The, I would definitely go with pretty much the same lineup that this deck has here. The only difference that you could potentially make is you could add Adramalek the Wrath, which, don't get me wrong, I don't think Adramalek is a particularly good card, but it's also the only kind of burn damage like Brynhilda that um, that Lightning has access to instead of fire, but it's, it is strictly worse than Brynhilda, so it's worth like kind of keeping that in mind if you do want to run it, or if you want to run, like increase your EX burst count, there are times where it will be a dead EX burst. Now, generally speaking, the objective of this deck is to destroy forwards as frequently as it physically can. You with your idiots, your Alcid combos, your just everything in your, your Odin, everything in this deck is designed to kill something or just move it out of the way. So, you know, you want to, if you're playing the deck, you want to play into its strength and just punch through your opponent's resources as often as you can before you go in for the kill. This deck looks like an aggro deck, and it kind of is, but the way that you're playing it is you're playing aggro through mincing through your opponent's forwards, so that they're having to discard cards, they're having to keep up with you while you're getting rid of their stuff, and then you go in for the kill. And similarly, you, you kind of have to bear in mind that your defences, because your offence is so strong, your defences are a bit lacking. The only thing that you really have as an EX burst is Odin or Edia. And Edia only really comes into her own later in the game when you've already set up a lot. So that's something that both the player who's playing the deck and the opponent of the deck should be keeping in mind. Because if you're playing it, you know, you're going for the throat as, you know, as hard and fast as you can. If you're playing against it, you might want to be doing the same thing. Go for the uh, go for the throw with a couple of early game forwards and don't overextend too heavily because you want to kind of bait out the El Cid combos as quickly as you can so that they've kind of used it and then you leave them there. But the Lightning player wants to make sure that you know you're kind of baiting your opponent into trying to go for you first. It looks aggressive, it's actually more controlling than you might think. And then if you're playing against this deck, you definitely want to kind of as I've said, play early units that are quite cheap, you don't need to do anything, you want to force their hand just like they're trying to do to you, and then once they've kind of blown their load, for want of a better term, then you can start, you know, playing your larger units, paving the way for you to start going in, and then you start going in for the kill. Now, if you're wanting to counter this deck in a more hard way than just playstyle, there are plenty of ways to do that. I've heard people complaining about the Also combo, saying it's overpowered. It's very good. It's perfectly counterable. If you're Water, Water has a lot of very, very good ways of countering this deck. Um, Minwu is an obvious choice, um, because if you've got a big enough guy out, then the Also combos don't do anything to you. Um, Cecil writes that combo off in completely, and the only way that they can really kill your guys is through Odin, or Edia. You have, um, and Ash has another ability where she can reactivate herself, so that gets you around um, Ammon as well, as well as having the ability to self-buff herself if she's targeted by anything. And if she's targeted by Alcid and an Onion Knight, she buffs herself twice, so she goes from 7k to 10k to 13k, which is too big for Alcid to deal with. So Ash is an exceptional card against this deck, because the opponent is going to have to kill her before they can move on. If you're playing under Earth, Vincent is a very, very strong play because the only way that the Lightning can really kill him is through the damage combos. So if you have access to things that can make him bigger in Earth, like Golem, Monk, there's all sorts of little things that you can do to make him even bigger than he should be, then that's ways of getting around this combo. You're, again, trying to bait your opponent into blowing their combos early so that you don't have to worry about them again. Because like most decks with S abilities, you should treat it like that. Uh, Earth also has access to Shantotto. This, board, this deck really wants to kind of build up its board as much as it possibly can before it goes in for you, because it's not going to play like one or two guys, because all of its combos involve playing multiple guys at once. So if you're playing a Shantotto, you already have an advantage. 
And then you also have access to um, Aerith in Wind, who can also make sure that you, you know, your opponent has to kind of play something, target it, you then counter and say, no, my guys can't be targeted, your ability fizzles, especially effective against an Alcid Onion Knight combo, because he has to play something with the Alcid in order to get the combo. Um, Ice, you have access to Capricious Reaper and Kuja, which, you know, um, no matter what your opponent is doing, because your opponent is trying so hard to target your guys and get them out of the way, they're having to discard additional resources to get your one card out of the way. If it's an Alcid combo, which is probably the most prominent play in this deck, which is why I've mentioned it so frequently, your opponent is going to have to drop eights worth of CP in order to kill him, because they play the Alcid, target your Reaper, drop a card to target him, burn him. Play the Onion Knight, drop a card to target him again to burn him and kill him. He'll still kill him, but they've just dropped God knows how many cards out of the hand for you to do that. So it's definitely, there's there's multiple ways to get around this deck. Fire has Emperor Xander, which is really, really nice because there's no way for Lightning to remove him from the game. So he's always going to get his ability off. There's always all sorts of different things to do. If you think of any other counters to the deck that you really, really like, then definitely mention them in the comments below and let me know. That's pretty much all I'm going to talk about with this video in particular, and I hope that you guys have enjoyed watching it, and I hope that perhaps you've gained a bit more insight into how Mono Lightning works, whether you want to play it, or whether you're going to one of the regionals that's coming up in the coming weeks to try and counter it and count and play against it. Um, there's lots of other ways that you can build this deck as well, so you could splash little bits into it and, you know, try something new and try something different for yourself. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to go to any of these regionals, because I, I mean, as much as I would love to, I'm aiming to try and go to the London one, so that even if I don't, you know, I don't care if I win or I lose, I, you know, I just kind of want to see people and be social, and I still don't really know what I want to play with it yet, and if that's even if I get to go. So, anyways, hopefully I shall see you guys next week, and if I do get to go, and if not, then you have to kind of just subscribe to my channel and tune back in and watch some more of my videos, I guess. But yes, as I said, don't forget to look me up on Twitch as well, because I'll be doing that every week, and hopefully I will speak to you guys soon. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all later. Bye.